Ratna. My name is Scott Morrison, and I am a longtime fan of Student U. Um, I joke that uh, there are so many Student U t-shirts in my house that my kids will be randomly, randomly walking around in them because um, I try to collect as many as I can. Um, I'm definitely on the teacher side of what Student U does. I'm a teacher educator now. Um, I think I started uh, working with Student U back in 2011, so it's been about a decade. And I like to think that um, really good teachers matter and they make a, a big difference in kids' lives and in the community. And I think about uh, some of the teachers that have come through, some are even on the call right now that I saw. Um, think about Tracy and Matt, um, who I saw uh, when they first started teaching and are still with DPS in various capacities. I think about Shara, who's teaching in Durham now after teaching in Greenville for a little bit and who's developing anti-racist curriculum at her school. I think about Laura, uh, who was all set uh, when she was at Student U to go to law school. Turns out she was a fantastic teacher. She stopped that plan, went into the classroom. And I think about my own student, Mireya, who a few years ago took a chance teaching at Student U, taught for three summers, and is now, after teaching in DPS, uh, working with Latinx ed. So um, I'm a really big fan of everything Student U does, and so I'm happy to um, facilitate this conversation today. Just a quick few Zoom reminders. Uh, stay muted if you can. Um, use the chat box. Uh, you can, you know, give us some virtual snaps or chat snaps, however you want to do that. Um, if you hear something you like, feel free to, to clap and snap in there. Um, if you have questions, put those in the chat as well. Um, and then I just want to remind everyone why we're here. Uh, we're here to get updates and insights from Alexandra and Elena. I have a series of questions for them and probably some follow-ups. We do have 10 to 12 minutes set aside for your questions. Um, so some of you submitted some before today and we will be monitoring the chat if you have questions that you put in there. Um, and for most of us, this is a chance for us to hear how we can stand alongside Student U, especially during the time that we're in now. And if we've been an ally, for a long time with Student U, that's probably what brought you here. And we can think about what it means to be an advocate and a co-conspirator alongside Student U uh, moving forward. All right, I think that's all my logistics on the front end. No private messages telling me I've done anything wrong yet. That's good. All right, so let's get to it. Uh, let's get to a, an easy warm-up question. Um, identity matters. Our own educational experiences shape how we understand education today. Um, all, all of our identities matter in the work that we do. So Alexandra, we're gonna start with you. Because Student U really focuses on middle, high school and college age students, would you give everyone uh, just a sense of who you were as an adolescent and uh, maybe any significant experiences during those times that have shaped who you are today? Yeah, first, it's good to be with so many of you. I feel like I'm holding back tears because of seeing so many friends that I have not seen in a long time. So I really want to say thank you for spending your precious lunch hour and adding another Zoom meeting in the Zoom world to be with us. It really does mean a lot to me. So thank you for being here. I was awkward, to no one's surprise. Um, middle school was rough. I remember my first time as student, you seeing our students who were working on, you know, finding their identity, who am I, what's my place in the world? And I remember a few of them thinking, someone needs to tell them it gets better. It's gonna be fine. You're gonna make it through this dark season of life when you're gonna get to the other side and this will all make sense. But I think it's important to name that I fled the Ivory Coast when I was 10, going on 11. So I entered middle school at a time that is really, um, so many changes are happening internally for young people. You become aware of your presence and connections to others. I couldn't speak English, um, was just moving to the United States, had experienced this really traumatic way of leaving a place that had been my home and had been a place of safety. And so that was very much in the water for me. If I think about an experience that really has shaped me, that sticks with me today, I have a picture here of my mother. Um, my mother is a fierce advocate of her children, all five of us, and I don't think I would have made it through middle school without her particular belief in my skill set and her ability to champion that for me when we moved to the U.S. So a story that I often tell and I share very quickly is that when I moved to the United States, I was in an ESL class because I didn't speak English, and I started coming home and speaking Spanish to my mother. 
Now, my mother fully believed that I needed to learn Spanish, and she reminds me every time I talk to her that she's disappointed that I did not listen to her, and therefore I'm not fluent. However, she also believed that I should be learning how to speak English. And so my mom pulled me out of the ESL program and moved me to Martin Middle School, which was the best school based on all of the ratings she could find on the internet in Raleigh. And then she reverse engineered my sixth grade experience. So I took all of my electives were in French so that I was learning English while my peers were learning French. And then she helped me translate my homework into French every night do it in French, retranslate it into English so that I could keep up. While I didn't speak English, my mother also advocated for me to be in honors math because she said that math was a universal language and I didn't need the words in order to understand what was happening in class. So I watched my mother as a single individual advocate for me and recognize that the system wasn't working. When I think about shaping my mother and her fierce uh, ability to fight for her child, is the person I desire to be and why I've chosen to do this work, to be that person who can be a fierce advocate for my students, for their parents, for my community, even in the face of people saying, this is not available to you, this is not how you uh, go through the process and recognizing that often systems are uh, not actually shaped uh, or designed in order to create the best outcomes for my students. So I do this work and I'm shaped by my mother and couldn't be here without her today. Thank you so much, Alexandra. Same question to you, Elena. Tell us a little bit about who you are. What were you like in those adolescent years and anything significant happened to you that shapes the work you do today? Yeah, yeah, thanks, Scott. Um, well, uh, Alex, Alexandra stole the first word I was gonna use, which is I was definitely awkward um, in middle school. I had the the blessing of being 5'10 at 13, which was a little painful for the social life, but it was great for athletics. Uh, but no, I, I, um, I'm a multiracial um, person and was a multiracial student. And I was often one of the only students of color in my, in my classrooms. And I, I think that really shaped me of um, learning how to kind of go between two or three different worlds at a time. Um, and I think that that uh, has really shaped how I approach my professional life, my personal life of kind of um, living between two worlds often. Um, I will share a uh, significant event that happened to me though in my education. Um, it happened when I was 16. And so for context, I grew up in a very loving but very low income household with my mother and three siblings. Um, and my mother uh, didn't go to college. And so she really struggled to have solid employment to be able to pay for all of our bills. And just like other families who often struggle to pay for basic needs, uh, we moved a lot when I was a kid. Um, but when I was 16, my family and I um, got a notification that we had been approved to receive a Habitat for Humanity house. And if you're not familiar with that organization, um, it's an amazing nonprofit that provides modest, affordable housing to families like mine that would otherwise not be able to afford or be approved for a mortgage. Um, and so I spent that year um, on site a lot, um, helping to, to build up my actual family home. And I might not look like it, but I'm still great with a hammer, still great laying sod, using a shovel. Um, and that was a really impactful experience for me, particularly because I was older and I wasn't gonna be growing up in that family home, but I was helping to build something that was gonna be um, able to be passed down into, into um, our future generations. Um, so if you fast forward six years from that, uh, when I was 22, um, the most proud day of my life was not when I walked across the college graduation stage, but it was actually the next day when my mother did. So, um, because so she had the chance to have a Habitat for Humanity house with a very low mortgage, um, she had the opportunity to have the gift of her time back on her lap. And so she used that to be able to go back to college um, and it really transformed our family. So I saw from uh, my middle school years to then being a young adult, I watched my family um, come out of poverty because my mother was able to secure a higher education. And so um, the work we do at Student U is really deeply personal to me um, because I have witnessed and experienced firsthand the impact that education has on the lives of not only the person getting the degree, but that person's descendants and all of their family members too. So my kids who you may hear making noise on this call at some point, um, they have a college educated grandmother 
a college educated mother and that security and accomplishment will impact their lives and the lives of their future children too. So I would say that that experience at 16 of receiving um, an affordable home really, really shaped me and our, our whole families. Holy smokes, Elena, I was not ready for that right there. That Your delivery was just perfect. Um, uh, what a story, thank you for that. Um, all right, the first question um, I wanna ask uh, Alexandra to respond to first. And um, the last year, 14 months has been a lot. Um, it's been a lot for everybody. Um, some would say challenging, mystifying, uh, unprecedented has been used a lot, um, and for many, traumatic. So I just wanna know, Alexandra, what, what, ha what has the pandemic, uh, the racial injustice, what has the last year revealed to you? Um, what have you learned from it? Um, and has it affirmed or confirmed anything you had previously thought or amplified anything you had previously thought? So a lot of questions in there. Give us some reflective thoughts on the past 12 to 14 months. Yeah, Thank you for that question, Scott. I'm actually gonna go back in student youth history and time to answer this question. So in 2014, we had this beautiful opportunity um, to graduate our first class of high school students. And it was a life-changing experience for me. I think at the time, as Elena shared, the most proud moment of my life, I think maybe sometimes still to this day was not my own high school graduation, but graduating our first class of students actually Side note, I ran into one of those students yesterday who's in a PhD program and that just, wow, incredible. Um, but at the same time, that same year, uh, student you started to wonder what was going to be our growth path. Well, who were we going to be when we were going to grow up and what was the impact that we wanted to have in our community? At the same time that we were doing the strategic work, we had the Mike Brown murder, and I think for the first time in my own professional experience as an institution started wondering, what is our role in this? How do we ensure that the work that we do with our students every day is placed in the right context of what is happening around them? And will we be um, in some ways only focus on young people and the work we see with them every day or we will, take, will we take a more strategic lens and a structural lens to say, in our work, we believe that as a result of structural racism and injustices in our world, our students are limited in their ability to thrive and we need to dismantle those systems in order to provide them with the most opportunity. Using that lens has meant for us for the past six years that we understand that good education policy is not just what starts and ends in a school building, that good housing policy is good education policy, that good healthcare policy is good education policy, that good criminal justice policy is good education policy, that good policing policy is good educational policy, that good community development policy is good education policy. So you fast forward to 2020 and this moment of reckoning for America where people for the first time many are saying, wow, I can't believe it's that bad. And for us institutionally, we've been saying, we have been saying this for a long time. We have been saying our students cannot perform at their best and cannot reach their full potential if we're not actively thinking about the lives of their parents. When Elena tells this beautiful story about her mother, we have had our own students whose parents have gone back to school as a result of the work that we have done with their children. And so for us, it was an unfortunate way to say we have been saying this, but I think there's also an opportunity to consider now that we are more of us on the same page, what are we going to do differently moving forward, right? And so I think for me, it has created um, also some surprises of places that we can still grow. I think I learned during the pandemic that the distance between us is greater than I envisioned. I think that there are ways um, that that distance does not enable us to build collective vision about what we really want to be true for our community and what we're willing to do to make it happen. I think it's easy to talk about policy or to talk about personal decision. And I think it's a combination of the two. And I think the pandemic 
help to see how do individuals, likely partners and unlikely partners come together to make personal choices that moves the community forward. And how out of that can we push our government to do things that it has never done before. I was telling Dr. Morrison before this that I am absolutely uh, my mind is blown by the American Rescue Plan. My mind is blown that a government is talking about how do we create conditions for women and families to thrive. These are education policies that actually matter for what happens in the lives of young people. And so I think that is hopeful, but I think that that distance between us is still here and potentially greater than we recognize. And we have a lot of work to do collectively to ensure that we're actively closing it um, as individuals, as leaders of institutions, as policymakers, it is our work to set the right frame that enables everyone to see their collective interest in moving towards equity and the particular role that they can play in moving us towards that ambitious goal. So I think that those would be my, my reaffirmations of what we knew, which were really painful and the opportunity that I think has been created as a result of the pandemic. Thank you for that. Um, I really appreciate that historical view. Um, as the organization has grown, I've definitely noticed a shift in vision and purpose um, that's looking at more structural inequities rather than just isolating education itself. Um, I remember um, being on campus in Summer Academy when um, George Zimmerman was acquitted and um, there was just a change in tone um, amongst everyone there. And it was just a reminder that it was more than just um, helping kids with their math skills, that there was bigger work that um, needed to be done and addressed. So thank you, Alexandra, for your thoughts um, as the executive director of, of Student U. Um, Elena, you're the program director and you have a, a lot of hands-on connection with uh, families and students. So same question to you from your vantage point. What has what the last 12 to 14 months revealed, affirmed uh, for you? Yeah, yeah, definitely. Um, yeah, so we have definitely learned a lot from the pandemic um, on the programming side. Um, we're still learning, and I am um, sure we're going to continue to learn um, as the next year unfolds um, with some of the ramifications that have happened. Um, but um, what, I, what I'd actually like to do is to, um, since Alexander spoke really well about um, all of us as like a broad community and things that we've learned, I'm going to kind of zoom in and talk about um, what we've learned from like specific student and programmatic scenarios. And so I'd like to share three scenarios with you all that kind of illustrate um, some of the things that we've learned um, this past year. So uh, the first uh, story I want to tell you is about um, a middle school student and she uh, is very shy in our program um, and has had a lot of social anxiety um, in school, particularly in the traditional ways of communicating. You know, you think about raising your hand, having to speak in front of your whole class or giving a presentation in front of your whole class. And that caused her a lot of stress. Um, and when she was able to, she would opt out of that. And so she, uh, her voice was often lost in a traditional classroom. Um, it wasn't always um, heard by others. Um, but with the onset of virtual learning, suddenly the social anxiety for this child was lifted. Um, and she had other mechanisms to be able to express her voice, like dropping things in a Zoom chat, um, doing collective writing over Google Docs with her peers or recording a video to submit um, a presentation on Canvas. And all these new methods opened up other avenues for her voice to be heard. And she really thrived in the classroom. Um, also virtual learning allowed for more access to extracurriculars because suddenly you could do extracurriculars in your house without needing transportation. And so she actually um, enrolled in one of our virtual dance clubs uh, last semester, and at the end of the semester, performed in her first ever live recital in front of a, a full audience on Zoom. And so I think she's a great example of the type of student who would really thrive in um, DPS's Innovative Ignite Academy that's coming out of um, the things that have happened from the pandemic. Um, and some of the learnings um, that I feel like we've taken away as a team, I've actually drafted as questions because I think that we've learned a little bit and then we're always learning and questions drive that. Um, and so the first uh, kind of essential question that's come out of, out of this scenario for us is how are we inviting all children's voices into our educational environments, not just the loudest ones? And how can we rethink what traditional schooling or educational um, programs like ours at Student U 
how can we reimagine what they look like so that we diversify personal expression to make space for all the voices in a room. Um, the second story I want to share is unfortunately not as um, not as positive. So we did have um, a student in our high school program who really struggled during the pandemic. Um, he really benefited from structured days and community building um, and all of that that happens in school, in the classrooms, hallways, lunchrooms, athletic fields. Um, and with virtual learning, all that suddenly was removed. Um, and he really struggled to self-create that structure by himself. Um, he spent a lot of time indoors, um, often a lot of time alone in his room, and his physical and emotional health really suffered. Um, he's an example of a student who would really thrive in DPS's in-person traditional schools. And I think some of our takeaway questions from our experience with him is, how do we uplift and honor the primary and secondary services that our schools provide, meaning not just uplifting the academic impacts um, our schools have on young people, but also uplifting the secondary impacts like community building, uh, peer accountability, social emotional supports, feeding programs, all of those things that students get at, um, in their schools. And the second question is how are we at Student U leveraging personal and institutional relationships to care for the bodies and minds of our next generation? Uh, the third scenario I'll share with you all um, is a programmatic one. And so we had an unexpected benefit uh, from the pandemic that occurred in our college advising and college programs. And um, so normally uh, for college advising meetings, you're trying to get a college advisor, a student, a parent, maybe an interpreter, all into the same room at the same time. Um, so you can imagine sometimes the challenges of scheduling those meetings. And if one person can't make it, that meeting often needs to be rescheduled for a, a later time. Um, but because DPS was able to provide all students with a device and provide an internet to all students who needed it, suddenly we could host college advising meetings anywhere and advising meetings um, in any location. Um, this led to more sessions being completed because they didn't have to continually be rescheduled. Um, it led to students finishing uh, their college applications and FAFSA or financial aid forms earlier. And that has really positioned our students to have more time to make really well-informed decisions about their educational plans, which we know is really crucial, particularly when you're first in your family to go to college. Um, some of the big learning questions um, that have come up for us out of this experience is how can we creatively eliminate barriers to receiving services, whether it's transportation or scheduling um, or otherwise. We've often thought about providing those things, like let's provide transportation or provide scheduling services, but how can we actually eliminate that as a barrier altogether? Um, the second question that's come up for us is how can we supplement the need for in-person relationships, like how we used to traditionally do college advising, with the need for frequent interactions to build trust among families and staff. And so how can we supplement some of the um, technologies that we've learned and mastered in a short period of time to be able to uplift um, and strengthen our advising services that we offer students? And so I'd say overall, the pandemic has taught us to continue to listen to what students and families tell us about their lives and their needs, and to not be afraid to be innovative with our approaches to meet those needs. Excellent. Thank you both so much. Um, Elena, I'm going to stay with you for the next question. And I want to remind everyone, if you have questions to um, uh, for Alexander or Elena, you can feel free to use the chat. Um, I'm going to keep going. I have two more questions. Um, and we have about uh, 20 or so minutes for this Q&A time. Um, so Elena, what, what is Student U's response to what we've learned in the past 12 to 14 months? Uh, especially with the, the programs that are offered, um, what are the next more immediate moves for student youth? Yeah, great question, great question. So um, first I'll uh, kind of give you a quick context to what we did um, when everything happened and then I'll speak to what we are doing kind of in the short term as we move forward. Um, so in March of 2020, which feels like is really only about a year ago, it feels like a very long time ago, um, we switched all of our programs online and that was a huge, huge, huge effort, um, but it allowed us to not pause services. So our year round after school program, um, our mentorship services that are offered in all three of our programs, our tutoring, our community gatherings, all those things still happened, they just happened virtually. 
Um, but Summer Academy in 2020 was not able to take place because of the restrictions at the time. And so we had to get really creative and think of other things to do. Um, we ended up providing at-home learning kits and books to our students, and we extended our mentorship um, services throughout the summer, which normally take a pause at that time. Um, in the fall, we continued with our virtual programming, uh, but we also opened our building as a learning center for not only our students, but also other students in Durham, so they could have a safe, secure place to do their virtual learning. Um, and all of that was at no cost to their families. Um, the virtual uh, programming and the learning center um, are still continuing now through the spring semester. Um, as we approach the summer, however, we are gonna be shifting gears um, and we will reopen in person for our five week summer academy. Um, we have four really big priorities for summer academy this year. Obviously the first being um, safety. So we must keep our students, families and staff safe during a time when many of our families will not have been, uh, sorry, many of our students will not have been vaccinated yet. Um, some of our, our parents um, similarly. Uh, we'll need to be following all CDC guidelines, which we will be, but we're also going to take um, and utilize learnings about running in-person pro programming from important sources like DPS, um, our own learnings from opening a, a learning center ourselves, and other community partners like Durham Academy, where, we'll, where we will be um, hosting our summer academy. Um, our second priority is going to be supporting the whole child. So we need to be cognizant that students have gone through an incredibly intense experience and we must acknowledge the importance of that experience. We can't just jump right back into life as usual. Uh, we must provide time, space, and energy for students to process what they have gone through and leverage resources they may need to help them heal from the past or gear up for the future. Um, so some of the things that we will be offering are wellness geared electives and time each day for advisory or, or homeroom spaces, along with social emotional activities and instruction. Um, our third priority is going to be community building, and this is definitely the most fun. Um, we need to have an intense focus this uh, year on community building, particularly because we've been physically apart for so long. Um, we know that relationships are central to our work, and we also know that students really need healthy, caring relationships with their peers and adults to thrive academically and socio-emotionally. Um, so some of the things we'll be doing is we are delivering new student orientations, and we will uh, have an intense focus the first week on community building that will branch into the rest of the summer um, as we move forward. And then last but certainly not least, our fourth priority is academic enrichment. Um, we will continue to create an educational environment that challenges students' intellects, raises their curiosity, and allows them to explore the world, people, and issues around them. And we will spiral in remediation as needed. But instead of pulling students out specifically for remediation, remediation is going to be integrated into the new and challenging material that we're providing to students. Um, we will also be providing all of our core content teachers with vetted curriculum and actually give them all of the lessons that they'll need to present during Summer Academy um, so that their focus can be more on lesson implementation and community building um, and they can put their energy there. So we will be providing our core content teachers with ready-made lessons. Um, and we will also be assessing where our students are academically during the summertime and use that information that we gather to help us um, make plans for how we will adjust our fall programming when we return um, in the fall. So speaking of the fall, we'll continue um, to shift in the fall as appropriate to in-person instruction as it's safe um, to do so. We'll incorporate our learnings from this past year and the summer to inform innovative shifts in our programming. So like uh, we plan to keep portions of our virtual tutoring and virtual college advising because it eliminated transportation issues for our family and had really, really high turnout. Um, and then of course, like I mentioned, we will take the academic assessment knowledge we get from the summer to help um, craft uh, what we'll offer in the fall um, for students as they return. That is a thorough response. I gotta say, I am energized right now just by hearing all of that. Um, thank you, Elena. Um, Alexandra, uh, same question to you. Um, as executive director, um, how do you think Student U uh, should respond or is responding based on what we've experienced 
focused and learned from the past 12 to 14 months. What's next? First of all, I just, student youth team is so strong and I'm just so delighted that you all get to see how strong of a team we have. Elena, you are shining like you do every day. I'm so glad that all of our partners get to see the strength of the caliber of the team that makes this incredible work happen every day on the ground. Um, I'm going to start by reminding us again a historical perspective that in January of 2020, many of you were there. We had this beautiful event at the W.G. Pearson Center where we launched this bold mission and vision of where we are heading that was really rooted in 11 years of working with our students and their parents and having them push us to imagine what could be different for our institution and our community. One of the most important parts of that mission change and vision change for us is understanding that the key stakeholders that we seek to journey with to support and to be part of their leadership journey were parents, students, and the educators that are a part of our institution. Another fundamental shift for us was recognizing with this idea of structural racism as of the institution and what we are seeking to dismantle that we needed to be more strategic around not just working with students, but working with parents. So having an intergenerational whole families approach. Another big part of our shift is acknowledging that student U has 14 years of working with young people and their parents in our community. And we have learned a lot, lots of it by trial and error, some of it through mistakes. We have learned a lot that has created the conditions for the young people that we have the incredible honor of journeying with to become leaders in their community and to be successful. And last but not least, we know that programs are important, but policies matter. And we need to ensure that the voices of our parents and our students are at the decision-making table, at the imagine, the dreaming tables to make sure that we're building this vision that is really rooted in the experience of the community members that we are uh, delighted to be in community with. So as we think about the future, I think it's also really important to name that when you launch such a bi big and bold mission, you think, this is a 15 year plan. We're gonna be working on this slowly but surely to get our bearings and do all of the strategic planning to understand what is the process and the path that we will use to grow into each of these new paths for us. And then the pandemic happened and very quickly, many of you know, student you wrote an op-ed that was really the reflection of what we were seeing in the lives of our students. Uh, Ashley Rouse Peters, who's our director of student and family support services. I remember I, met with her, I think we were outside six feet apart. And she told me a story of using our emergency funds to help a family get um, stable housing in a hotel um, in order to be able to make it through this crisis. As I was hearing this story, I remember thinking, how might this student and this family thrive in an online learning environment? We need to recognize that there are young people and families who are going to need more from us as a community in order to be able to thrive. And so from that op-ed, we started to meet with lots of community partners um, in order to imagine what might it look like to create safe spaces for young people to go who need somewhere other than their homes in order to be able to learn. And how do we fund it in a way that is reflective of the importance of this necessary intervention during the pandemic that enables us to make this um, offering sustainable. And so with the YMCA and Kate's Corner and the DPS Foundation, we lobbied the county commissioners and the city council to make a joint investment to make learning centers available in our community, which helped us serve a thousand students. For us, that is a small in some ways a seed of what we know student U has the capacity and need to do moving forward in order to be part of making our community more just and equitable. So we are in the process of imagining what does a core function of advocacy look like for our institution? And how do we ensure that we pick the right issues that are relevant and necessary now that impact the lives of our students? So if you've been paying attention in Durham prior to COVID, our school board was in the process of reimagining um, redistricting school boundaries in school, uh, how we invest in them. That has a huge impact in the resources that each school has to support students and is a matter of equity in our community. So we, as we are getting out of our COVID and we 
support our young people in our program every day, we are gearing up to imagine what will be this conversation? How can student you be a part of framing the conversation? How do we ensure that our parents and other parents in the community understand what's at stake? How do we create safe spaces for them to be able to share what they need for their children and ensure that our elected officials take their cues from them as we reimagine what will happen in our Durham public schools. So that's one example. Another thing that we know is really important is that intergenerational programming requires skills and requires someone on our team who's thinking every day about how do we create the conditions for parents to be able to get connected to the workforce development opportunities that they have told us they desire. During the pandemic, we interviewed parents, we surveyed parents and 60% of our parents said, I want to go back to school. I need to be upskilled so I can have access to a better job to support my children. We want to be a place where our parents cannot just come and get support for their children, but also for themselves, because we know that that whole family's package is what will lead us to equity. So we are Ashley Rouse Peters under her leadership. We are in the process of finalizing a job description and we'll have to do that work full time, which we know eventually will likely be a whole department at Student U because we serve 550 students and their families. So we're talking about a thousand people that we have the opportunity to impact. Um, again, as we're thinking about growth and social emotional learning, which we know will continue to be necessary for our students, we are imagining what a wellness clinic can look like in our program where students and parents can drop in and get what they need um, at no cost to them because we know that that's really important. So for us, the future looks like first and foremost, always ensuring that our own programs that work with our students are really reflective of their experiences. And Elena spoke so beautifully and eloquently about the opportunities and the challenges ahead of us and how we will respond to them. The other important place for us as we move forward is to ensure that the lives of our students inform how we advocate for policy change outside of our institution that has the capacity to impact 33,000 students who are Durham Public School students whose well being and whose potential we believe we need to collectively protect in order to ensure that they become the change agents for our community. And the last is all of those are going to require us to make strategic investment in not just what we have done for the past 14 years, but who we are becoming as the institution continues to grow. Yeah, excellent. Thank you for that, Alexandra. All right, I see a couple of people have had to leave in the chat. Just want to remind everyone, we're going to go up until right about one o'clock, but we will not go past that. And um, the the question after the next one is about what student you needs. It needs from us uh, as part of the support team uh, for what they do here. So um, we want to definitely be uh, cognizant of that. Before that, there's a, a question from the audience. Alexandra, I'm gonna to go to you first. You can answer it uh, however you want. If you want Elena to step in, please pass it along to her. The question has to do with learning loss um, and how Student U plans to cope with that. But I, I do wanna say this. One thing I love about Student U, there's many things that I love. One is that how it kind of really threads the needle between supporting students to succeed in schools as is, but also recognizing that the historical institution of schooling was not meant for kids like those who student you serves. And what I mean by that is sometimes the norms and standards don't always align with who our students in our community are. For example, one of the first days I was on student use campus in summer academy, I was blown away at the brilliance of the students, but I came out in ways that are not always measured by how we traditionally understand competence or intelligence. The brilliance was there, but maybe the teachers or the standardized tests didn't pull out that brilliance. So learning loss itself as a concept, there's some tensions there for me, but I do understand that there have been a lot of disruptions in the past 12 to 14 months. So Alexandra, how is student you gonna approach some of these disruptions with uh, traditional learning in the past year? Um, I'll actually jump in um, and speak first and then um, pass it over to Alexandra if she has anything to add. But um, yes, so this is um, a question that is near and dear to my heart, both uh, professionally and as a parent of two DPS students um, who are on their lunch break, and you may hear some chatter through the door. Um, and I think uh, exactly what you said, um, Dr. Morrison, about 
the even the terminology learning loss, right? We went, we have gone through and are still going through a pandemic and students have had disruption in their traditional education system while also having other major experiences that are building them up as um, stronger individuals as they as they go into their adulthood. So um, learning loss in itself is, is a challenging um, topic and, a, and I know is kind of a challenging um, discussion currently in the education sector. But the way um, that we currently are planning to address this is one, trying to identify where we are. So getting assessment data from students, getting a, a snapshot of where they are academically and where they are social emotionally, and then make a plan of action. And that is a fluid, that is a fluid approach. So there is um, one, the uh, identifying what is in our sphere of control and tackling that as much as possible. We run after school programming, we run tutoring, we have access to quality mentors. And so leveraging those things to fill in where we see um, gaps are for our students. But the second thing is to acknowledge where we don't have sphere of control and where we want to be a support to hold other systems accountable and, and make sure that they have what they need to provide this for students. And a lot of that comes from uh, making sure that we're a good partner to DPS and see, you know, seeing as much as we can to support the school systems and um, working together to think about the long-term work of this. I think one thing to keep in mind is that um, trying to, if you've been out of school for 16, 18 months or in a disrupted school system for 16, 18 months, um, you're not gonna catch up in two weeks of an intensive camp. It's going to be a long-term approach. And so how can we be good partners with our school system um, and learn from each other so that we can support the children in our community as we look at this as a long-term approach. Um, but the last thing I will say too is, and I don't think this is a surprise to anyone on the call, but um, children are resilient. Um, and I think that that's something to center and remember. Um, our future generation will have this as a commonality that every child in the world went through a pandemic in 2020. And so they have developed strength and coping and they've experienced trauma and they've experienced joy. And those things can happen together and they're becoming strong individuals. And so remembering that um, as we try to craft a plan for how to support families and students with learning loss, Remember always to ask them, ask students, ask families what they think they need in order to um, fill in loss because um, we know our own needs best, right? So a student can know their needs, a parent can know their needs, teachers. And so making sure we're involving the whole community as we, as we move forward. All right, All Alexandra, right. any follow-ups to that? Yeah, I think everything that Elena said is spot on. I think that we want to be mindful as a community and I think one of our roles is to be framers of conversation, that it doesn't have to be one or the other. It doesn't have to be recovering academics or taking care of the social emotional health of students. This is an opportunity to recognize that social emotional health of students should always be blended with the academic experience of young people, because you can't learn well if you're not in a position to do so. And so I think one of our roles is also to be an agitator of the district and saying, what concretely is your plan to not just have Operation Summer that focus students and remediation, but what, how are we going to create an environment where those students feel safe to re-enter into a learning environment? And how are we going to train the teachers to feel like they have this new competency to be able to do work that people go to school and get master's degrees and PhDs to be able to do really well? Next week, Elena and I and Rathika are meeting with the district because as they're thinking about how to use the $136 million that are coming to Durham Public Schools as a result of the American Rescue Plan, I'm intentionally naming how much money is coming to Durham Public Schools that they get to direct how it is invested. They want to learn from us about our advocate model that we have been running for the past decade that has been such a fundamental part of individualizing the experience we provided to our high school students to make sure that they could thrive. They want to know how are you doing that and can we take this model to scale? So beyond, I think this idea of partnership is both ideation, let's dream together, and then it's also accountability. After we're done dreaming, how are we gonna make sure that it is actually happening? And I think one of the gifts of Student U and why we have decided to grow in our mission and vision is that we are uniquely positioned because we serve students in all of the middle school, 
all of the high school and their parents to be able to understand are these ideas and what the district is committing to actually taking root in every single one of the schools that our students attend? And if not, how do we share that information back to the district and make paths to ensure that young people are getting the quality education that they need? So in this conversation about is it learning loss or is it social emotional health? It's both. It's always needed to be both. And this is the opportunity to ideate about what that can look like. And when we're done being at the dreaming tables to ensure that all of us are contributing appropriately in order to make sure that it comes to pass for every single student in our community. Excellent. Um, as we get here toward the end, um, what does student you need uh, for from the community uh, and from the people on the call? I'll, I'll start with that question. One of the things that is really important to us and why I have loved my being able to be a part of the student U world is that we are a community, right? And what we need are ambassadors of our mission and our vision in every space that you occupy. So for example, Dr. Morrison, who's on this call, helped facilitate the White Caucus group that we held this last summer and not only facilitated it, but then went back to Elon and used that same model in his school with his students. What we need is fierce advocate of equity and for you all to come to these events and learn about what we're doing, but to also consider in my own sphere of influence, what am I doing to be an active agitator, co-conspirator, ally supporter of the work that we're doing within the lane that you know you occupy. So that's number one. Number two, all of the things that we talked about today are an increase in our body of work. And I'm so excited about it and it is the right thing to do. And we wanna be consistent, not only for the 550 students that we get to see today, but for the 33,000 Durham Public School students that we don't work with every day, but for whom the policies that we will advocate for can also be transformative. And that increase of work from us will also require increased financial support to make it happen. And so we ask you to be really strategic around both your level of um, investment in student U, but also to be creative in thinking about what corporation do you work with or work for and how do they invest their dollars? And might this be an opportunity for them to journey alongside us as we move forward? So for us moving forward, it's both about continuing to bring other people into the fold. So next time we have one of these conversations, think about who are the two or the two or three or 10 people in your community who would benefit from coming to a place like this because they're on the verge of, of being ready to be activated to do justice work in their own lives. And then how might they be a part of our community to help us sustain the work financially to be able to increase our impact. Elena, do you have anything to add? No, um, I think um, Alexandra has spoken really well about it. I think the acknowledging that this is additional work and is necessary additional work um, and being mindful about the, um, the resources that uh, we may need um, support in in order to move forward. All right, well, we are at 12.55, uh, right on time with where we need to be. Uh, let me just close out my part by saying thank you all for attending. And um, on, the, on the topic of what student you needs and what we can do, I, I do not know of an organization that has a stronger track record of using every penny wisely and producing measurable outcomes. They have statistics to show you the success of their programming and they have story after story after story that will show you that the work they do matters and that they need continued and ongoing and increased support. Uh, it has been an honor for me to share space with you all. Um, uh, my, my heart is beating fast and I'm ready to go change the world and energize my community. So um, thank you all for sharing your brilliance. Did I get all the, the, um, the things in there? Anyways, I'm gonna turn it over to Treat, um, uh, who's gonna close us out. Thank you all. Thanks, Scott. Oh my gosh. I, I am energized. I work for this organization and I feel prouder than I can even imagine um, that it could have been imagined. So thank you all for being here. Scott, thank you for leading us so well and um, moderating and asking great questions and, 
and being a part of this organization in such a profound way over the years. Um, I also want to thank Elena and Alex. Um, it's just you both continue to uh, inspire me and I hope everyone here um, is excited to see where we go next. Um, obviously it does take, uh, it, it takes a team to get all of this up off the ground and um, and it also takes a team to keep our students and families going. So there's a few things that we want to do and ask you if you are willing to consider. Uh, we have, as you know, as you heard, we're going back to in-person summer academy. And so we will have our career day and that's a really important place where our students get to learn about all the interesting things that are to be done out there. Um, it's not always about just being a doctor or a lawyer. There's a lot, there's a lot going on. So, there's anything that you want to share with our students, please let us know if you are willing to do that. Um, we'd love to have you come and see our work being done at Summer Academy. We're going to be very, very careful about um, COVID precautions, but we do want to open that up. And obviously, and I'm, I'm the development director, so you know I have to say this, um, donating to the organization is really important. We cannot do this without funding. And we have a lot of donors and funders on this call today and that just warms my heart. And for those of you who I hope will feel moved to give, um, it would really help us out and uh, put us in a really strong position to help all of these students and families that we work with and that are part of our programs. So you're welcome to, um, there's going to be a, a, a link in the chat, which if you can look right now, there's a, an exit survey, which will, allow us to follow up with you, um, or you can just go on our website, but please fill that out. And also, um, you know, if you have any questions, of course, I am always available <laughs> to talk to anyone who wants to get to know us better. So thank you everybody for being here and um, really hope that I will get to meet you live and in person this summer. I'm very excited we're going back and thank you all for your time and energy and look forward to many great times ahead. Have a great afternoon. Thank you all so much for being with us today. Yeah, thank you all for taking the time to, to join us today. We really appreciate it. And I wanna give a personal shout out to Dan Kimberg, Student Youth Founding Executive Director. It was so lovely to see you, Dan. Um, we hope that we are making you proud um, by hearing how the deep work that you did and the seeds that you planted to really build a culture of vision and of community engagement and of humility um, is continuing to live through the bones of the institution. So thank you for inviting all of us into a vision that was bigger than us and continuing to show up um, to support us. Thanks, Alexandra. So proud to be a small part of this really big, beautiful community.